Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today, I'm delighted to talk again to Joram Van Cleveren. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. Yeah, alaikum salam and uh, Ramadan Kareem. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for coming back on again. You've had been on several times, hugely uh, popular speakers. Really hopeful you've found time uh, from your busy schedule to, to come on. And um, as many people know, um, you're a former member of the Dutch Parliament, a representative of the Party for Freedom, as it was called, or is called. Um, and you've uh, you have submitted numerous bills related to Islam, such as those calling for the cut, uh, your extraordinary personal and theological journey in this highly recommended book. There we are, Apostate, a fantastic cover. Um, that's the back of it as well. Uh, I've read it and I really do recommend that if it's your most extraordinary uh, journey. And today, uh, Joram has kindly agreed to give us his assessment of the current political situation for Muslims in Europe and what many see as the hypocrisy of European politics and the war on Gaza and the more general situation of Muslims in Europe as well. So what are your thoughts uh, on, about this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's a great honor, uh, and uh, I, I love blogging theology. I always watch uh, the, the, the the several uh, yeah programs, and uh, yeah, I think I love it. It's 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 uh, it's a good content always. So uh, thank you uh, yeah. from my side that having me on the show. Yeah, well, uh, I think um, just like in the, in the UK, uh, when we look at continental Europe, uh, there is a big problem when it comes to pressure on uh, the Islamic uh, communities uh, and uh, of course it is related to several uh, geopolitical problems uh, think about for example gas um, so yeah yeah it is it, there is there's a big problem and of course when you look at all the um, the elections and the outcomes of elections in several European countries like the Netherlands, the country I'm from, but also uh, in uh, Portugal, uh, when you look at uh, Sweden, Italy, uh, you see all these far-right anti-Islam uh, uh, organization uh, starting to win and starting to become uh, really part of the government as well. So it's not only that they're an opposition party anymore, but they are uh, really a government right now. And in the Netherlands now, we have uh, the Freedom Party, my old party. Uh, they won uh, big time. Uh, it's the biggest uh, uh, win ever. Uh, they have almost like 25% of the Dutch uh, seats wow. in, in wow. Parliament now. Uh, and they are uh, trying to uh, yeah, establish a new government here. And uh, um, I think they will manage uh, to do it. So we'll see. But it's not, uh, it's not a, a good... A development, of course, not for the Muslims and for everybody who loves freedom. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's very, uh, very, very worrying indeed. And you were saying to me be, uh, briefly before we, we started uh, recording that you're off to the Dutch Parliament uh, shortly. Um, explain to us why, what what's going on with the Dutch Parliament at the moment. What why that's so such an issue. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, there are uh, uh, several topics right now that are uh, that are hot, so to say. Uh, one of them is, of course, is the the whole um, the negotiations to form a new coalition here. That's the Freedom Party, and they will work together with uh, the Liberal Party. That's the old party of our current Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. Mm -hmm. And there's the Farmers Party. I don't know if you heard of it. There are a lot of farmer protests in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and they have like an own political party in the Netherlands as well. And that party also won, and they are very willing to work together with um, with, the, with the Freedom Party. And there is this uh, smaller new organization that's more anti-governmental, but still, so to say, um, mainstream. Uh, and those four parties are trying to, uh, yeah, trying to establish a new government. So we'll see about that because it's very... I think it's very worrisome, uh, but there's also another uh, topic here is that the Dutch government is uh, responsible for um, uh, the surface of the F-35 fighter jets of the Israeli army. And there has been uh, a court decision at, at three, four weeks ago that the government should stop uh, with this surface, uh, but right. they continue right. anyway. So, so, so what, what, uh, it is... So, sorry, why did the court, the Dutch court, uh, rule 
that it was uh, they had to stop supplying these weapons to to Israel, the Israeli government. What was the reason? Yeah, the, the, well, the reason is that they said, well, uh, we see that there is a war going on and that uh, the people of um, uh, Gaza, the Palestinian people, are uh, yeah, almost exterminated by what we see because right. uh, we have hunger now as a weapon, as, uh, as the UN spoke, and they talked about genocide. So they said, well, there is a possible genocide going on. Really? So right. in the Dutch um, constitution, they say it's illegal to participate in things like that. So they said right. they ha you have to stop supplying those right. weapons. Uh, uh, but the Dutch government did it anyway, uh, and they still do it. Uh, so there's uh, it's 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 a big issue right now here in the Netherlands because uh, well, if if they don't follow the law, uh, well, <laughs> you're, that, what is, <laughs> then we have a really big problem, of course. It's extraordinary. So you have a, a sort of court in, in Holland uh, saying stop supplying yeah. weapons. Stop uh, conflict where Palestinians are being divided, um, and your your own government is ignoring. Uh, I mean, morally they should stop, let alone for legal reasons. But they're continuing in defiance of the law of a court ruling. That's most remarkable yeah. because I, I thought Dutch was a law-abiding country that respected, um, you know, freedom and the rule of law and not killing people indiscriminately. And uh, it, it's shocking. Then it seems that the the Dutch government is ignoring that. Um, that's qu quite something. And this is not even the this is not Gert Wilders' party, is it? So yeah, it, uh, apparently when it comes to. It mm. So is it? No, no. It is. It's. It's uh, like I said. It's. It's, it's, the, it's the Liberal Party of the, the current Liberal Party. And, uh, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, mm -hmm. and he also said that he supports Israel unconditionally. Wow. A Liberal Party. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Liberal in uh, in uh, in the continental context is a little bit different, I think, than when you compare to the US or the UK, because Liberal here doesn't mean per se that you are truly liberal. You can right. also be strangely enough, very conservative and still be liberal because it really has to do with economics. So it's an economic uh, liberal party, so low taxes stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, they are very conservative, but this this party isn't conservative. So it's just like, it has no ideology anymore. The only ideology they have, and that's what people who are member of this party, uh, even members of parliament said, it's only about power. And when it comes to Israel, apparently um, there are other rules than law. And I think that's very worrisome, not only for the people of Palestine and the people of the Netherlands, because we have to, ha well, of course, we have uh, we have the rule of law, at least you think. <laughs> uh, you think. Yeah. It's, it, it is, it's a very, very strange, uh, very um, twisted context where and, and and the hypocrisy of, of what, what what you see in in a lot of western governments when it comes to israel and palestine is very very disturbing i think well it is and you say it's very strange and i, I mean it, historically holland or netherlands has stood for tolerance and freedom and respect for individual rights and so on and and now not only are they defiance of, of, of the court ruling which says you mustn't uh, arm a country that's committing probably committing genocide say probably i think that was what you said um yeah. and using uh, uh hunger uh, or food as a weapon of war starving the whole population the un has said that I, I, I don't quite how how we reconcile this what, what what why is uh why is the dutch government giving unconditional support to this middle middle east regime that's doing these things i, I why would it do that uh, if i can ask a very basic and probably naive question just so i can get my head around it is there any any answer you can explain yeah well in in the netherlands of course uh i think there are three three big um movements almost so to say or three big actors when it comes to uh the policies of a lot of western governments when it comes to israel mm -hmm. uh one has to do with theology uh from uh of course uh, you know um um, that, that a lot of people here think that uh, Israel is the chosen people and with Israel they mean the Jewish people uh, in general and that has to do with uh, uh, not only Catholic but especially uh, modern Protestant theology mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of when, when I look at the church I'm from because I was raised as a, as a Orthodox Protestant Christian uh, they always said and they uh, pointed to a part of the Bible called Genesis, the first book. And in Genesis, there is this first 
chapter, uh, I think chapter 12, first three, but I can mistake, maybe it's six or nine, I think three. And it says, uh, whoever blesses Abraham will be blessed by the Lord. And whoever curses Abraham will be cursed by uh, the Lord. And the translation in the church is that Abraham is like a synonym for the people of Israel. So you have to support Israel, the people of Israel, because they are chosen. And whoever blesses Israel will be blessed by the Lord. And whoever curses Israel will be cursed by the, by the Lord. But, so but this, you know, I, I, sorry, I don't understand what you've just said, because Genesis, okay, Israel didn't exist. I mean, a Abraham was a long, long time before Jacob was born. Jacob is the uh, also known as Israel. That He was the first guy, if you like, to be called Israel. Uh, he had 12 um, children who became the famous founders of the 12 tribes of Israel, of Jacob. So is Jacob is actually a man. Uh, but this was long, long, long after Abraham. So to say that Abraham and Israel slash Jordan are somehow the same is is historically impossible and anachronistic and bizarre because it, se it seems just random. I mean, you could say anyone was Israel. I mean, why not Adam? <laughs> just, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, seriously, I, I actually don't understand the logic of that. I mean, I was rereading Genesis or the Torah recently, and it's very clear that Abraham is, wasn't a Jew, wasn't an Israeli. Um, why? Because these are concepts that were born, uh, if you like, uh, much later with Jacob, who, who God then called Israel. Um, so is this just ignorance of the Bible? Is it deliberate twisting or distortion of the biblical narrative? Or uh, how are we talking about this interpretation? Yeah, well, I absolutely agree <laughs> with what you just said. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people in the Christian church I'm from and also from a lot of other churches don't agree with us uh, okay. because uh, they say, uh, like like you said, Jacob is Israel. And they yeah. say, so the house of Israel and one of the children was, of course, Judah. They say yeah. that line goes to the goes to Jesus Christ. And they say, well, this is the chosen people. And these chosen people have to be uh, protected, have to be followed. And they don't really see um, like the, the historical context. For, for them, it's like there's um, in, I think, 1820 till 1830, there was this Irish uh, minister. Um, and Darby. Um, Is it Darby? Darby? Yeah, John Nelson Darby. And John Nelson Darby, he fell off his horse. <laughs> And you know the story, I think. He fell off the horse. And then he was at home sick for a year. And of course, when you are a minister, what do you do when you're sitting at home? You start reading your Bible. So he yeah. was reading the Bible. And he said, we have to reinterpret this this, this first because uh, the, the, couple of, uh, the last couple of centuries, we've seen it all wrong. Jacob is Israel. Israel is the chosen people. So we have to protect and help the Jewish people. So what did this guy do? He went to the United States and he was a very influential person because he was uh, like a, a top guy from the English church. And he uh, went back to the UK as well. And he uh, surrounded himself with um, people who were very influential, very rich, uh, mm -hmm. but also uh, very driven. And one of the persons he uh, influenced a lot was uh, Mr. Moody. When you go to the United States now and you want to have like a real evangelical upbringing, yep. you have to go to Moody Bible it's, School. It's, yeah, well, Moody Bible in, in Chicago, Illinois. And I've actually been there. I mean, not studied there, but I've actually been to the church there And uh, when I was a Christian, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, of course. Well, then you know. And uh, John Nelson Darby was like uh, his teacher. And another person he, he thought was um, uh, Mr. Heckler. And Mr. Heckler was uh, was one of his students, so to say, and he said to Mr. Heckler, you have to go to Vienna because in Vienna there is this guy and this guy is called Mr. Herzl, Theodor Herzl. He's a Jewish man and he has he's written an article, uh, the Judenstaten, this, the Jewish state, and it was written in 1894, so long ago and long before Israel even existed. And he said, well, this man has a vision. He wants to have a Jewish state. And I, as and, and I'm talking about John Nelson Darby, said we have the same vision because we think that the Messiah will return 
at the moment that all the Jewish people will be gathered in their homeland in Israel. So we have to support them in this project. And that's what he did. So he went, uh, Mr. Heckler, he sent Mr. Heckler to Vienna. He knocked at the door of the house of uh, Mr. Hetzel. So knock, knock. And uh, he said, well, I'm here. I'm here to help. I'm your friend. So Theodor Hetzel asked him, yeah, well, who are you? And he explained, we have the same vision, etc." And it is this man, Mr. Heckler, with the help of John Nelson Darby, uh, that opened a lot of political doors for mm. Mr. Hetzel, because back then, of course, the whole context was very anti-Semitic. A lot of people in the English government, the Dutch government, German, France, doesn't matter. Everybody disliked the Jewish community and Jews in general, because it was very anti-Semitic context. Uh, but he opened the door politically. And then, of course, this political context started to change. And in the end, of course, uh, adding everything up, including uh, all the horrible things that happened during World War II, uh, that, that made like there is Israel now. So uh, uh, to go back to the question, uh, what is it? I think this is one This is one very important thing that a lot of people don't think about, but, but right. the whole context when it comes to supporting Israel has, has to do with especially Protestant theology. And because of the evangelicals in the United States are still very, very strong and they're all related to this kind of thinking. And you still have like um, little spots, so to say, in continental Europe uh, of very influential, very powerful people. Uh, they think the same. So this is the theology part, so to say. And then of course you have like uh, the part of the anti-Muslim organizations that are really rising. And, and when I look at when I look at my old party, it's very secular. The Freedom Party was very secular. It was one of the critiques of my grandfather. He said, "Why would you work for an atheist?" That's another story. But they're very secular, and they said, um, "Well, we don't care about theology. Uh, we don't believe anything uh, when it comes to God or the spiritual or metaphysics or whatever. We only support Israel because they are fighting our fight." We are in a war with Islam, an historical war, and they are fighting our fight in the Middle East. So they are our Western base in the Middle East. It was literally what the Freedom Party said. And they also said Palestine already exists. It's called Jordan. So oh, the state uh, of is Palestine. So they said the whole country of Israel, even with the Golan parts of uh, Lebanon, even a little part of Turkey, and in the south, the Sinai and uh, Egypt, it's all Israel. And we should fight for them because as the, as uh, uh, this, this country of Israel becomes bigger, it's more Western, uh, more our culture in the Middle East. So we can fight them, the enemy, and in their view, it's Islam and the Muslims better. So that's the only reason they, they help and they support Israel. So it's not, nothing to do with theology. They, they, it's very anti-Islam. They say we're in a war with Islam. We have to protect the West. And they are fighting our fight. So give them money, give them weapons. And then, of course, there's the third thing, the third part. And that has to do with um, like the current uh, policies uh, of, of uh, so to say, mainstream Western uh, uh, governments, our government, uh, like we talked about the F-35, uh, the, the jet, uh, but also when it comes to um, oil, when it comes to gas, geopolitical st strategic position of Israel, of course, when you look at the United States, they want to be close to Iran. Iran, uh, you have the Suez Canal, of course. So, uh, and that's why they support Israel. A famous uh, speech of uh, Mr. Biden, the current president, in 1986, he said, if there was no Israel, we, we should have entered an Israel. Why? And he said it explicitly, he said, because they serve our interests in the Middle East and beyond. So I think the combination of these three makes it very, very uh, hard for people um, to penetrate or change uh, uh, the support that a lot of Western governments have right now for the state of Israel. And, and yet... And yet Thank you for sharing that. It's a very lucid and a very interesting uh, perspective. And yet we are seeing, if I'm not mistaken, an increasing number, maybe a majority of young people in the States, uh, in Europe, who are watching TikTok and other social media. They're seeing the reality on the ground of what's happening. Unbelievable pictures we're seeing on Twitter every day of, uh, of appalling carnage and great crimes against humanity taking place and th th they're not fooled by this narrative that it's just uh you know the west defending itself against islam they they see the carnage um so that this yeah, whole hence, yeah, hence 
sorry, yeah, hence the, hence the American government says let's ban TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so, not, not the only thing, of course, but I think it is it is crucial because what you say, social media is almost a threat to mm. uh, the, the the mainstream narrative in the West because Islam is dangerous, yeah. Muslims are scary, we are right, they are wrong, and as for the older generation, it was easy, and they of course they have like uh, the history of the world, the Second World War, and yeah. that's all true. Yeah. But things change. And of course, the whole geopolitical situation is different than, let's say, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very worrying. I mean, if you get a sense at all of a religious revival, I don't mean amongst Muslims, I mean amongst Christians in, in the West, in, in response to these different factors, because there's definitely a, a revival of Islam globally. But is there a similar kind of revival of Christianity or, or is that still on its inexorable decline in, in the West, do you think? Well, it is uh, it is declining still, uh, and uh, in the Netherlands we have a research that's done every ten years. It's called God in the Netherlands, and they started in 1966. And every ten years they give like an update and an upgrade <laughs> because yeah. they expand research and they ask, "What do you believe? Do you believe in a heaven? Do you really believe in hell? Do you believe in the Bible, etc.? Uh, do you believe in a, in a personal God, etc.?" and uh, for the first time in 2016, so in, t in about two years we have a new one, but in 2016, that's the most uh, uh, current uh, research that is done on this topic, uh, th the researchers said uh, Christianity is marginalized. N the Netherlands is not a Christian country anymore because over 80% said we have no... Uh, uh, we have no connection with the Christian culture. We have no connection with the Christian religion. We have no connection with it at all. So, and they said, well, that's, that was remarkable said that because they didn't thought it was declining deaths that fast. Really? So in the Netherlands, especially, and all the, it's the same goes for, for uh, Belgium, for example, also all Scandinavian countries, so Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, it's all going down when it comes to Christianity. So the, the uh, well, it's it really is changing. And, and I think that is another thing that's very worrisome, because we're now talking about uh, Gaza, of course, that the connection that people have and the understanding of and for religion in general is almost gone in a lot of Western countries. So if someone says, oh. I'm talking about uh, my, my freedom of religion, or I think it's very dear to me to be able to pray, a lot of people th uh, think that well, they, these people are crazy. What are they talking about? Praying, God, religion. So it's very hard almost in general to be religious in the West. Extraordinary. I mean, what, what, what role is there, do you think, uh, of Dawa in, in terms of Muslims sharing information and knowledge about Islam and calling to Islam uh, in Holland? What, 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 what uh, Dawa projects exist in Holland? And is this in any way, do you think, a, a way of pushing back against this encroaching Islamophobia and, and, and hostility and demonization and marginalization of Muslims in Europe, which is happening everywhere, is beginning to happen, unfortunately, here in the UK with we're seeing more extreme statements from the government uh, demonizing and marginalizing Muslims who have any views in the public domain. We, basically, we've been told to shut up, basically. Um, but what, what role does Dawa play, do you think, in, in, in actually changing this situation? Yeah, I think that's it's crucial. I mean, perhaps it's even the, the most important thing that you can do and that are, is able to change, like, so to say, the hearts and minds of people. Because uh, we talked about the decline of Christianity at the same time, we see now, and it's for the first time that they are doing some research on this topic, is that you see a lot of, so to say, locals converting to Islam. Uh, so that's, that's that's a new phenomenon, so to say, and alhamdulillah, of course, it's, it's beautiful to see, but uh, it's still very small but it is a development that is uh, that is really starting to grow and even so much that a lot of uh, governmental institutions say, well perhaps we have to do some more research why are people converting to islam what is it uh, and of course it has to do with the fact that there is no so to say big narrative anymore people lost their belief in christianity and i can understand why because if you dive into the religion and you want to grasp it in a rational way as well it's almost impossible so the most rational, natural religion is Islam. So people are, so to say, 
pushed and pulled towards the religion of truth. And when it comes to uh, dawah, I think um, it's it's very important because you see people on the streets, of course, giving dawah. But uh, we we have uh, our own to be uh, to be modest. <laughs> we have our own small organizations called Islam Experience Center. Um, and what we do is that we share the basic message of Islam through virtual reality, augmented reality, AD holograms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's like traditional Islam in a Japanese way of presenting. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's working uh, very well. We've, we've uh, A lot of people uh, taking shahada. Uh, we, we see when we go to schools that people are changing their minds. They said, well, I'm not Muslim all of a sudden. But I didn't know this. I didn't know this story. It's really new for me. And I think that is a problem as well, because later after I converted, you start reflecting about what happened. Of course, uh, yeah, there's this change. But I also felt, and that's something I realize more and more now, that I almost was like misled in a cultural way. Right. Because right. the whole culture is almost anti-Islam and not so much in a, in a uh, very specific way and very explicit, but very implicit and very on the, on the surface, so to say. And, uh, can you give me an example of this indirect, indirect uh, hostility or, or this hostile context for Muslims? Yeah, and, uh, uh, to start with, like say some, some symbolism. Uh, in the Netherlands, you have uh, like uh, little towns and cities, but also municipalities like you have in the UK as well. And they all have their symbols like flags or whatever, like a, a lion or an eagle or uh, stuff like that. Right. And in the Netherlands, you have uh, a few towns and uh, they have like a symbol with a with a, a duck without a beak and without the feet right. and uh, yeah and first of all when you look at it like, okay it's like a like a strange symbol <laughs> uh, why why had this duck why doesn't it have any feet why where's the where's the beak um but then of course when you start researching it's from okay i i see this symbol in uh, so many flags and so many um like shields and and stuff like that and uh, when I dove into it, I realized that it has to do with uh, the Crusades. Uh, because families who fought in the Crusades and they were trying to, so to say, liberate the Holy Land, Jerusalem, from the infidels, and that's the, the, the Muslims in the view of the Christians from the Middle uh, Ages, of course. Uh, when you came back and you killed a lot of uh, Muslims, then you were rewarded as a family and they gave you this symbol so you it was like an honor to have this symbol in your family weapon but some of these families for example the family of kuik kuik is a, a small town in the south of the netherlands it was a family very rich family it still is over by the way uh, but uh, they uh, all, they were so powerful that the whole country of kuik was named after them so there is now a town called kuik but the family weapon of the family of kuik is in the is, is the symbol of the city right now yeah. But that symbol yeah. is this beak without feet and without um, mm. uh, the beak. And so uh, we have like an anti-Islam symbol in a lot of cities because it's not only Kuik, we also have Heemstede, that's another town. We have a city called Bergen. And in all these, um, in all these flags, you see this anti-Islam symbol. Uh, then, of course, uh, and it's more theological. Just, 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 sorry, just to interrupt you. Can I just clarify? Do you think most people understand the significance of that symbol? I mean, do, do they at some level get it, or is it just a symbol? Do you know what I mean? Well, nobody knows it. Nobody knows. It. No, but it's oh, just, no. just it's, it is a symbol that is there. It's in front of you, but you don't know what it is. So a lot of people yeah. know. But it's the same with when you go for example, uh, uh, some some friends of mine are Catholic, and one of them yeah. went to Santiago de Compostela. It's like oh, yeah. a, a, a kind of oh, yeah. <laughs> for the Catholics. So they go to yeah, the pilgrimage. But yeah, but when you go, to, yeah, we, yeah, and if you go to Santiago de Compostela, and some people are um, crawling almost to the church because that's yeah. the so to say the end point. But inside of this church of Santiago, uh, the Holy Apostle Jacob, so to say in in English, the brother yeah, of James. Jesus, yeah, James, so, yeah, yeah. Sorry, James, yeah. And 
this uh, the, the thing is that when you enter the church and you um, uh, are near the altar where it's it's like the end of your pilgrimage, you see a very big statue of a man on a white horse with a, with a spear and a sword. And that's the end. But when you look at it, and it says this is Santiago, the holy eh, Iago. Um, but they call him in Spanish, they call him Matamoros. And Matamoros ah. means the killer of Moors, the killer of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see when you, and you are in the church and you see all these uh, chopped off heads of mm -hmm. Muslims, the turbans. And, but when you, when you think about it, this is really strange because it, this is like a, a theological thing. It's, 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 right. it's a personal right. spiritual trip. You go on a hajj, so to say, for the Christians, Santiago mm -hmm. de Compostela, and the end of your trip is looking at a statue that's called the Moor Killer, the killer of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So it's very deep in uh, European culture. Uh, and, and to be more uh, political, uh, when you look at the last battle between, so to say, the Ottoman Empire and Christian Europe was in 1683, right? The Battle of Vienna, that's yeah. from the croissants. Uh, and for, for people who don't know the story, of course, in the end, uh, the Western uh, the Europeans won and they baked breads in the shape of a half moon. And of course, there was the crescent moon. That's why it's croissant, crescent. And they, bro they broke it to say, well, we broke Islam. So also a symbol, of course, of Islam or the, the competition with Islam. But the thing is, this 1683 thing, the year that this battle was there, is still there because we have an old Euro commissioner. It's called, his name is, well, uh, was Fritz Bolkestein. He was from the same political party of our current prime minister, Mark Rutte. Um, and he said, when it came, when it comes to the negotiations with Turkey, uh, oh, yeah. are they uh, a, a, a membership of the European Union to, to enter into the European yeah. Union? Yeah, yeah, they have the membership of the European Union, and this is like 10, 15 years ago, maybe even twenty. And he said, well, if this man, and he's a very big name in the Netherlands still, he's like the Nestor of the Liberal Party. He's like the the teacher of Geert Wilders. And so he's a very big name. And Geert Wilders was still in the political party, uh, the, the liberal political party of the current prime minister. Uh, but this guy, Fritz Bolkestein, the, the Euro commissioner, said back then, well, if Turkey gets its memberships, 1683 was for nothing. Ooh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's very deep. And this is like a liberal organization. So they're mainstream. But mm -hmm. if these thoughts are in a political parties like that, you don't even need... A freedom party mm, mm, mm. and and it is and it's very um if you add it up all these uh sim the, the symbolism uh, conscious or unconscious it tells you a lot about how europe europe is in the game so to say when it comes to islam yeah, and yeah. nowadays i think um and i think you you have the same problem uh, in the uk as well when you are a practicing muslim and you want to vote when it are elections you almost cut between the left and the right yes because when you look at the right they say your ethnicity is not good or we, we hate your religion because of historical context etc etc mm -hmm. and on the left side they say well we we love you because you're a minority but we hate the things you think and the things you believe we don't like your moral system so the yeah. core of religion is isn't there they don't like it they don't want it so if you uh, and uh, to put it um, uh, say so to say a little bit more explicit if you're on the right side you have to uh pledge allegiance to the the the, the flag of israel so to say and on the left side you have to pledge allegiance to the lgbtq flag so yeah. you're cut in between yeah. so, and it doesn't mean of course that if you are not left-wing or right-wing that you all of a sudden hate right-wing people or left-wing people or gays or jews or whatever you just want to be yourself but it's mm -hmm. almost impossible because both sides, left and right, are pressuring. And they say, well, you have to deny one part of your identity. And of course, that's not possible because that's who you are. I mean, I, I think I mean, uh, people say, um, uh, I don't know if they're right, right or not, that in terms of Sharia, in terms of Sharia teaching, um, that, that, that Muslims are not supposed to live en masse in non-Muslim countries in, 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 where, where God's law is not upheld and so on. They're, not, they're supposed to live in Muslim lands. Um, but Muslims can live in non-Muslim countries if they're doing dawa, if they're business people, they're doing trade, they're involved in diplomacy or other such things. 
But the idea that millions of, of Muslims should choose to live in a non-Muslim sure. country, um, it doesn't seem to be supported by the Sharia because it's it's potentially dangerous. It's subversive to the faith. If you're if you're if you're in a in a, in a, kuf, a kufa context, a non-Muslim context with these influences, um, it's not very uh, conducive to a healthy Muslim lifestyle for all the reasons you, you you've just mentioned. So, but many Muslims came to say Britain. Uh, were invited here, of course, uh, as migrants, economic migrants. So many took that opportunity to work in our health service, or our railways, or our factories up north, and so on. Um, and they thought they'd go back because this is what well, this wasn't their home home country then. But they didn't. Most of them stayed. I'm not saying they shouldn't have stayed. I'm just saying perhaps the wider context. Uh, they did choose to stay. They had children, of course, and the third generation, maybe fourth generation now, is. Uh, living in the UK, and they're experiencing precisely these problems. They're stuck in the middle between the left and the right. They're, you know, they're, they're vulnerable to LGBT influence and other dodgy influences in schools. And on the and on the right, of course, they're being pushed to uh, support nationalism and a Zionist agenda and so on. So I, I guess what some people would say that in a sense we shouldn't be in this situation in the first place uh islamically but now we are because obviously we are and and the muslims who are born here uh, and others are british citizens so that, that that is kind of it's just a reality now but islamically should we even be here uh, in these numbers as a population civilian population just living i'm not talking about obviously the exceptions with businesses and uh, and and, and dawah work and diplomatic and so on but do you see what i mean is, is do, do, do you think there's a point there or yeah, I think because uh, especially when it comes to Dawa, that that is like a, a core mission you should have as a Muslim community, because it, it's uh, when you look at the Quran, I think it's in Surah sixteen, uh, Ayat one twenty five, uh, call out to the way of your Lord. Mm. But a lot of people don't call out to the way of the Lord; they right. don't call out at, at all. So they're very busy with the things of dunya, and of dunya. course, I, I I get it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course, we all do, uh, unfortunately, but it's not what we should do. We should, when it comes to Islam, we should invite people in the best way possible. And I think mm. that a lot of people, especially Muslims, of course, don't do that. And mm. I think that we should. Uh, and if you don't, I think it's a, it could be a threat for your children to be here. Because I yeah. think that like the pressure we talked about earlier when it comes to freedom of religion, especially uh, the freedom for Muslims to practice their religion, I think it's, it's will, it will become harder and harder the coming years and decades because now in the Netherlands, for example, they are talking about circumcision of boys and they say, well, isn't that a kind of mutilation? And then, of course, we have uh, talked about so, uh, the on the in, I, I, Sorry, I just can't help but comment. Mutilation of boys, circumcision, wrong and all that. These very same, same people, presumably, abortion on demand, which is the mutilation and killing of unborn children because that's autonomy, women's right to choose, individualism, freedom. But when it comes to so the mutilation involved in killing unborn babies is not an issue, but circumcision is. I, I was just looking at that uh, incongruity morally, I think, from people who have these views. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and the, the, there are so so many many examples of that, unfortunately. But to uh, to, uh, to show how this pressure is growing uh, in in France, for example, you're when you're not eighteen, you're not allowed to wear a hijab in public anymore. Uh, when we look at, for example, halal food, uh, especially halal meat, uh, in Belgium, and they will do it in the Netherlands as well. They are trying to have like a total ban. They can only import it. You cannot slaughter anymore. Uh, when when it comes to uh, wearing, for example, dresses, we have seen the, the example of the um, uh, jaleba. Was or a few boys here in the Netherlands, uh, like uh, eight nine guys in school, and it was like a, a secondary school. They were mm -hmm. wearing a jaleba, and the school said it's a threat. So you have to take it out, and you have to change. And of course, it's, it's ridiculous because there is no law or whatever. But the fact that this school really tried to ban it and that there was a lot of support here in the Netherlands. And this is just that this happened two weeks ago. It shows you how this pressure is, is growing. Uh, uh, we have like uh, constant um, discussions about whether uh, people can pray at work or not. So if people are trying to ban your freedom to pray, I think you have a big problem as a Muslim.
in this context. The same goes if you're not allowed to eat halal food or you're not able to get halal meat anymore. I think it's a problem. If you are a girl, you want to practice and you don't have a hijab or you're not allowed to wear a hijab, I think you have a big problem. So I can uh, totally understand what you just said. That is becoming problematic to be here as a big Muslim community if you don't do Dawa, because that should be like the core business. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the Dawa essentially legitimizes our, our presence. Otherwise, we're just we're just like uh, any anyone else pursuing the the dunya, as you say. And I mean, I don't want to get into the subject of Hijra because we're running out of time. But I mean, there, there are some. Uh, I mean, I've been very fortunate recently, the last year or so, to visit some amazing Muslim countries, uh, like Qatar. I've been to Doha very recently in uh, uh, Istanbul, in Turkey, and. Uh, and other places uh, and th these are experiencing major cultural economic and religious revival there's a very sophisticated i mean Qatar is a first world country um uh, with a very interesting uh, system there which is very highly developed and religiously uh, very mature i think quite balanced and uh, extraordinary uh beacons i think of hope and not that we could all move to, to, to Qatar it's a, a tiny little place really but um I just gave it as an example of of, of, of hope in in a, in a way that there are some some amazing uh, Muslim land. I'm not saying they're perfect, of course, but uh, is, is, uh, uh, Turkey as well, for all its problems, is uh, it, it has an amazing heritage, and there are many wonderful Muslims there who are doing incredible work in Dawa, in, in scholarship, in Islamic sciences, uh, in the universities there. Um, there there's some great beacons for hope, and people are moving to these places from from the West. Um, but I'm not saying that's a solution, but nevertheless, it's there. No, and I think in the end, uh, well, uh, of course, we don't know, uh, Alim, but um, we are here. Mm. And yes. some of us are born here. So Absolutely. apparently, there is a reason that you are here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so no, you're right. Really localize Islam, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that Islam grows here as well. And mm -hmm. there are many good examples in the UK, but also in the Netherlands and in some other parts of Europe, where you see that there's a very, that Islam is flourishing, not only in a religious sense, but also affecting in a very positive way, the the area where it is, like the mosque, it's it's starting to make sure that people that the, the whole environment, crime rates go down. You see people uh, trying to uh, start businesses, and it's very remarkable uh, to see. But it's of course these are small examples. Uh, but uh, you don't know. And maybe in the future it will grow. So if everybody should leave, <laughs> then uh, of course I, I'm not saying. Uh, but my comments were historical rather than current. Uh, but obviously we have second, third, fourth generation Muslims. Now they're British Muslims and or, or uh, Dutch Muslims and so on. That that's now the reality, uh, uh, very much so. So well, we have to, as I say, find our renewed sense of purpose. Maybe in Dawa, uh, in in localizing Islam, as, as you put it, finding uh, you know uh, putting deep roots in the local culture, reviving civic duties and charity and public works, education, oh. and, and bringing a, a vision, a, a spiritual vision of life, which uh, the, Europe has lost completely, g given the the virtual extinction of Christianity in many places, Islam can offer a very compelling, I think, um, vision of, of of spirituality, of God and the afterlife and, and so on, uh, and who, who, who Jesus was, you know, the historical Jesus, the real Jesus. Um, so I think there's a huge amount of work to be done. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, But I think in, I, you cannot really translate it into English, but I always ask, uh, when, when people ask me, non-Muslims, they often ask me, well, what do you have to offer as a Muslim community? Mm. And, of course, when I start explaining them in a theological way what it meant to me as a person, it doesn't say so much for them because they're not religious most of the time, the people who ask me. So I always tell them, well, we have the three G's in Dutch. And we, oh, yeah. it's called God, Gezin, Gemeenschap. It's, it's a lot of G's. <laughs> but in English, it means God, God community, and um, um, family. Uh, so in those three, uh, of course, uh, are core concepts. Of course, we, we all believe in Allah. Uh, we believe in God. That's the main, that's the, that's the source of everything. But then, of course, there is the family as well. And the, the, yeah. you should have a strong family. And, of course, the broader family is your community in your neighborhood, but also yes. in an even broader sense. So, And I always tell them, well, that's what we have to offer. 
Yeah. And that is something that everybody longs yeah. for. Yeah. Also, and, and sometimes people say, yeah, well, perhaps you have a point there. I said, no, it's not perhaps. I know we have a point there because that is what it is. So, uh, inshallah, we'll do something in, uh, on the long run here in the Netherlands and in the UK as well. But, uh, but there's a lot of uh, work to do, as you just uh, mentioned. Yeah, no, I, I like that what you said about fa the family values and in, 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 in the cohesion uh, and strength of Muslim families is very well known. We see that in, in Ramadan. And this attracts a lot of people because the alternative often is, is divorce and breakdown and uh, uh, isolation and loneliness and so on, which, which is endemic in, in, in the West at the moment. So there's a real, as you say, there's a real contribution that uh, Muslims can make to uh, re reviving the, the, the positive values that Islam does offer uh, very much. Well, um, I know you've got to go off to the, the Dutch parliament now. You're a, a busy man. I wish you well with that. Um, I'm certainly going to look into this whole issue of the uh, uh, later, I mean, of the the, the Dutch court uh, ruling on the, you know, the, the uh, is illegal to supply weapons yeah. to a country what's committing uh, genocide, and but the government ignoring that, uh, and I think this is extraordinary, um, extraordinary moment, a paradigm shifting moment in Dutch history after the war, after the Second World War, where the government basically has gone rogue. It seems to just doing its own thing, regardless of the constitution of your country. I mean, this is uh, remarkable. And I'll, I'll certainly go look, in, look into that a bit more, I think. So um, thank you very much, Joan, for your, your precious time. And as always, for your incredible insights into European Muslim life and politics and the, the existential realities that we all face. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you again for having me on the show. And uh, it is it really is the, 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 the whole issue about the, this joint strike fighter, because that's the name of the, the airplane, the F-35. It really is a big thing because if the Dutch government does this, I can imagine that other governments do this as well. Right. And international law goes yeah. for international context, so other countries as well. And it's, it's ridiculous to see that uh, on the one hand, uh, to just end with this hypocrisy of, of, of a lot of Western countries. And they, uh, on the one hand, you see the Dutch government preaching to other countries, you should upheld human rights, etc., etc., And at the same time, they they facilitate genocide indirect in Gaza. So it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's really, it's, it's mm. sickening. No, yeah, well, this is very true. Uh, well, that's a very sombering thought. So thank you very much, uh, Europe. And uh, till next time, and uh, best wishes in the Parliament this afternoon in Holland. Thank you very much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Take care.